The International Chamber of Commerce Sri Lanka is the national office of the Paris-based business organization. The ICC comprises of membership of 45 million members in 130 countries. Trade facilitation, export and import and cross-border trade and issues relating to freight forwarding and many other matters of importance are addressed by the ICC. ICC Sri Lanka works through several committees to debate discuss and suggest solutions on subjects related to the mandate of the chamber. Each of these commissions are led by professionals in the committee, with many committees functioning. ICC includes a membership committee, international relations committee, policy and advocacy committee, training and development committee, banking committee. ICC is the sole authorized guaranteeing agency for a tier car it's an internationally accepted customs document which enables duty-free and tax-free temporary importation of items as commercial samples. The Atiya Karnit reduces costs and red tape. The ICC is also known for its popular publications invaluable for bankers, lawyers, arbitrators and anyone involved in cross-border trade. Its members are provided with a member's privilege card which includes discounts with multiple retailers. ICC Sri Lanka's vision is to be the organization of choice to advance international trade and investment for businesses in Sri Lanka. ICC Sri Lanka's mission is to be the change agent in national policy formulation and implementation and facilitator of global businesses with Sri Lanka and disseminator of information on the development of business utilizing the services of ICC Paris while continuing to be a facilitator of dispute resolution. In addition, the ICC Sri Lanka organizes seminars, lectures, meetings with business leaders, and gives recognition to Sri Lankan businesses for outstanding achievements. ICC can play a special role in connecting business to the world and be a driving force for all Sri Lankan businesses. seek for business, look for insightfulness. If you seek for politics, look for anticipation. If you value lifestyle, look for the extraordinary. If you love sports, look for the passion. Daily FT. Be empowered. Digital innovation is accelerating across all industries and markets as companies invest to differentiate themselves. However, this also increases a company's risk. The digital attack surface is much broader across endpoints, network edges, and the cloud. Data breaches and ransomware continue to increase in sophistication. With Fortinet, trust you are protected everywhere your people, devices, and data are. Fortinet offers broad visibility across the entire attack surface, an integrated platform to reduce management complexity, and automation for fast and efficient operations. Fortinet, making possible a digital world you can always trust. and an eminent panel of speakers sharing their thoughts, ideas, and experience on cybersecurity, bringing local and uh, global case studies, and of course, educating us on, on how we should look at facing the new normal. So this is a current issue I think all of us are facing, and we have brought uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, technology and bringing the global and local uh, experiences into the session today. 
So let me first, first of all, introduce the keynote today, uh, keynote speaker today. That is Michael Joseph from Fortinet. He is the director system engineering uh, for the Fortinet. Michael is an industry veteran with over 27 years of IT experience. He holds bachelor's degree in computer science and started his network security career in 2000. In 2003, he was a part of the two member team that started the Fortinet business in India. And currently as a director system engineer, leads the pre-sales team for the SAC region. In the past two decades in security field, he, has, uh, he also has worked with one leading security vendors, WatchGuard and Bluecoat. In the from the region, to the engineering and product management team for channelizing customer business, security requirements, and help develop solutions to meet local market requirements. He engages with customers, partner, partners to advise and guide them in addressing security challenges, incidents faced by the organizations. He's also a regular speaker at various and articles in various print and social media. So without further ado, let me uh, welcome Michael and over to you, Michael, for your keynote uh, address. Thank you, Boshin. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen. Hope uh, it's visible. Yes, can see Mike. Okay, thank you. So uh, the small agenda for the next 10 minutes, uh, I would be touching upon one of the uh, global attacks which happened. And uh, at the end of that, I would also say what was the context why I picked up this specific one. And then I would just touch upon in terms of what are the kind of security measures, what anybody could be looking at uh, to protect against ransomware and also is uh, or most of the majority of the employees are working from home what could be the security framework what one should be looking at and uh, how fortunate can help in that journey so when we talk about uh, colonial pipeline this is a us based uh, uh, <clears throat> company which is into energy who supplies uh, uh, fuel and various other uh, refined products, majorly in the East Coast. Percent of the fuel supplied in the East Coast of uh, United States is catered by Colonial Pipeline. <clears throat> so people who are not familiar with East Coast, uh, obviously it include it starts uh, the pipeline, uh, the 5,500 mile pipeline starts from Houston in Texas and goes all the way to uh, New Jersey. It includes Washington, D.C., New York cities, et cetera. So this pipeline fundamentally is capable of carrying 3 million barrels per day. And when I look at the revenue of the company, the company's revenue for uh, 2020 was uh, 1.4 billion. And they had paid uh, 820 million USD in dividends in the last two years. Now, there is a reason why I've mentioned about this 820 million and 1.4, but uh, in the due course, I will highlight that. What is the reason? Now, let's look at us to know what was this attack and how did it happen? So <clears throat> this uh, attack, the engineers early morning, five o'clock, he saw a ransom message on the computer and he informed the superiors within one hour, the complete uh, 5,500 uh, mile pipeline was completely shut down as a proactive step because the company was not sure in terms of what is the magnitude or what is the uh, level of uh, 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 inroads what the hacker team has got into. And the company did uh, uh, confirm that they paid around 4.5 million as ransom. <clears throat> now, in a, any typical ransomware attack uh, here, since all the corporate data was encrypted, 
after paying the ransom, they got the decryption key. They uh, decrypting the data using the key was a very slow process. They could restore the data much faster from the backups, and that is how they started restoring the data. And by May twelfth, they restarted the fuel supply. Now, if you go into the technical details of that, it has been confirmed. And uh, since there is a, uh, a statewide investigation which is going on, where the CEO has to present to the Senate, he has already appeared once be before the U.S. Senate. It's uh, confirmed that the reason or the uh, entry point was a legacy VPN a user who was using a legacy VPN, which was not supporting multi-factor authentication. And due to the weak password, it got compromised. And that is how the hackers got into this network. Now, let's look at what was the damage or what was the impact. Now, obviously, when we are talking about shutting down a 5,500 mile of the fuel supply in that region, obviously people started panicking, they started putting uh, uh, fuel, the fuel stations, uh, one can imagine that there was long queues in front of it, there was black marketing, and obviously end result was the fuel stations ran out of uh, gas. Now, due to this uh, natural uh, 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 challenge which was faced by the common man, obviously the US president declared a national emergency to allow tankers to supply fuel across Uh, fuel. There was a surge in the fuel pricing where the pricing of the fuel uh, reached the highest in the last six years. And on the 12th of May, the date when which this pipeline was started uh, restoring or, or the fuel supply started uh, uh, restoring, there was an executive order from the US president. I've given the link uh, uh, or you can search the internet where you can find that. Uh, this is the uh, statement uh, published on the White House. Uh, with a executive order in terms of the cyber security framework and laws and guidance what company companies need to follow the federal agencies or the government agencies what they need to follow in terms of the incident what they are supposed to do in terms of a ransomware what they are supposed to do etc similarly the the cert uh, and the fbi uh, uh, in us also they are collaborating and they have given a clear brief in terms of this attack. I have given the link for that also. And what were the findings, et cetera. The link is available here. Now, <clears throat> the point is uh, with a legacy software, what was used and using a weak password, a compromise happened. And in the Senate, when the CEO was questioned in terms of what was the uh, amount of money what was spent on uh, assuring or protecting the uh, no, IT infrastructure. The answer given was that he said uh, we spent. The question was asked in terms of uh, what is the security spending. Again, he clarified saying that this 500 million includes the cyber security also. So the CEO was not in a position to categorically say this is the number of millions or this many hundred millions have been spent uh, on the cybersecurity. And uh, that is where I wanted to highlight that, you know, this is a company where they were uh, paying in the tune of 800 million as dividends in the last two years. And the total IT spending in the last two or three years was uh, 500 million. And in that 500 million, he was not able to say how much was the pie of cybersecurity. And this is common in most of, uh, in a lot of companies as well, whether it is in our region, where the focus on cybersecurity compared to the uh, pie, what the business gets, the pie, what somebody else gets in terms of marketing, et cetera, the due importance is not given to the uh, cybersecurity uh, and for protecting uh, the IT infrastructure. Now, first, in most of the cyber uh, uh, compromises or uh, attacks, uh, which happens in this way, Mostly the common people are not impacted. The company gets impacted. Uh, there is a brand reputation. There is a financial cost, uh, loss, et cetera. But here you have a scenario where the common man was hit and common, uh, common man was hit for multiple days where uh, their uh, businesses' lives were impacted. 
Now, is it limited to only this uh, uh, fuel of life? This could be true for a healthcare. This could be true for a transport industry. This could be true for uh, all kinds of industries. And think about uh, if it were to get compromised in the healthcare industry or in a transport in the transportation industry, where all the signaling, everything is automated, and if somebody was to compromise it, they can take you know, the nation to ransom or the city to ransom, etc. So, and that is where I want to highlight that sense and sensitivize in terms of what is the importance of protecting the assets and. to protect the cyber security. Now, to get into <clears throat> this dark side who was responsible for this uh, uh, attack, it's interesting because, again, why one of the reasons why I took was that, uh, again, now dark side is a ransom, uh, is, is a, a company which offers ransomware as a service. So it's like a dealer model or a franchisee model kind of, where you don't need any technical skill set, a uh, non-technical person, who has some malicious purchase this ransomware as a service, like how we do an online shopping, and use this tool, customize the tool the way they want it. And it's very interesting that the dark side website also gives a 24 bar 7 uh, uh, support helpline where, when you're using this tool, if you need a further assistance, they will help you, etc. Now, in case of like any other ransomware, when you use this malware, what it does is, you no, know, it uh, uh, once it gets an inroad into any organization, it takes uh, high encryption uh, protocols like RSA 124, etc. Now, as far as dark side is concerned, uh, from a geography perspective, they are based out of Eastern Europe. Some say it's based out of uh, Russia. Now, one thing is they are one of the biggest uh, or, or most successful financial groups. I was reading that. In the last nine months, they have uh, 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 made more than 80 million USD in, you know, uh, in terms of this multiple hacks, what they have been successful about. Now, the last point, again, for legacy VPN software and a weak password got compromised. It was uh, targeted by DarkSide. Now, when the state uh, uh, FBI and other agencies got into the picture and investigation, et cetera, they went after this, this 4.4 million was paid in uh, Bitcoins. So they went, up, went after the Bitcoin chain and they acknowledges and they confirmed that they were able to recover almost 50% of the money which was paid by Colonial. Um, <coughs> to see that uh, the same weaker password or the weak password what was used was used in the Bitcoin chain infrastructure as well. And that is what FBI and the agencies use to <clears throat> break into that Bitcoin infrastructure and then extract the money as well. So it just clearly highlights in terms of the criticality of uh, using uh, strong passwords and the, the real necessity of using multi-factor authentication in today's world. So with What has been the trend, what Fortinet had been seeing based on our uh, FortiGuard research team? Uh, what, are, what are the kind of uh, number of uh, ransomware threats uh, seen uh, over a period of last six months in the second half of 2000? You can see from July, it has been consistently growing. And in the month of December, it had been very high compared to the other months. That is due to the holiday season in uh, US, Europe, etc. And end of the day, everybody, uh, all these hackers, they want to extract money. It and that is why you see a spike during the Christmas season. Now, another thing from a uh, advanced uh, uh, threats. This is a statistics again uh, in terms of the second half. These are some of the APTs. Uh, the the region says where this APT was uh, um, uh, originating from. The names are there. Uh, I would also. The point what I want to highlight here is in most of this, you will see uh, no, India was the topmost country from, from where the detected connections to IOC is originated from. So no. Likewise, in most of them, you will see India, you don't see Sri Lanka because you know, from a relative uh, percentage volume of um, no, users or number of uh, incidents, etc., it could be less. These are geographic uh, uh, global numbers. 
but uh, what we will see in India, uh, you know, or, or in our region from a SaaS perspective, I'm sure this could be the similar kind of trend what uh, one could expect in in terms of what were this APT is all about. The top two, what you're seeing, uh, uh, they were all uh, COVID fishing campaigns and uh, then using the fishing campaigns, people trying to extract money out of it. Uh, some were targeted for specific vertical, some were targeted for specific uh, 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 regions, uh, specifically Middle East or uh, Europe or uh, US, etc. Now, let me just uh, take uh, two minutes to explain as to how ransomware works and how one can delivered into the uh, network. It can be a uh, weak password, it can be a phishing email, it can be a uh, malicious link uh, uh, which, uh, which is sent to a user when he clicks on it, uh, no, then the attack happens. And then he's looking for the sensitive data, he exfiltrates the data, then he uses the uh, no, command and control center and encrypts the data. So, and then looks at uh, moving within the network to see whether we can uh, reach uh, more assets in the network. So, uh, which can help uh, in this journey in each step, uh, what could be the solutions, what one could uh, look at. The other one which I want to look at is, uh, <clears throat> In today's world, are, are uh, based on the current challenges what we are facing or the market is facing, etc. What is the enterprise uh, user access trends? Uh, what is expected? Now, these are all predominantly data based on Gartner. So, Gartner says by 2024, 75% of the applications would be using multi-factor authentication. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sure uh, with the pandemic, uh, this would have uh, the adoption of MFT would have increased, and uh, the slides or the use cases what I showed also highlights in terms of why MFA is key, uh, important. The other point is in 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 case of uh, BYOD again by 2025 they say there will be 20 uh, 12 billion uh, installed IoT devices. Now from a work workspace, I'm sure uh, this is a global phenomenon. It could be a phenomenon in Sri Lanka. It's a phenomenon. Uh, shift uh, the teleworkers, which used to be a small minority, uh, which used to be senior management or limited to the sales, the marketing, or uh, some of the very uh, small uh, uh, portion of the total workforce. Now that is going to considerably increase. Now that percentage could change based on the geography, based on the nature of business, etc. But that is again inevitable uh, thing. The other one is in terms of the adoption of the cloud. Again, uh, due to the pandemic, pandemic, uh, cloud adoption has increased uh, globally and the cloud companies are Gartner also says. So that is where in terms of the architecture change, what is required, where uh, what you're seeing now in the screen is what uh, the typical the, uh, security architecture where you have a data center, where you have a campus and the DMC and you need to, one, one needs to worry only about the remote uh, workforce. But in today's scenario, that has completely changed. There is no boundaries for your uh, uh, network, uh, there is no boundaries for where your data is residing. It's like a more of a mesh kind of a sure. The security framework and the objective of any of the organization should be looking at protecting the users and protecting the data. Because protecting the network, etc. because the users are there everywhere and the data is also there uh, spread across. So the two factors, what one needs to work, uh, look into and uh, keep tracking is the users and the data. So that is where uh, the, all of you, uh, all the people listening would have heard or read about this. This is very relevant. In today's world, this is a, uh, again, a model which was there for more than 10 years, but it has taken uh, uh, much more prominence and it's become very, very relevant in today's pandemic world, world uh, where users are working more and more from home. So this zero trust model, what we are talking about is you know, uh, devices, people, networks, workloads, and data, how one needs to look at each of this. On the right side, we have just mapped in terms of what are the to take care of this as different aspects of the zero trust. So with that, actually, uh, I conclude uh, my session. Uh, so anybody who wants to reach out to Fortinet team to get more data, uh, to have a discussion in terms of how we can help uh, 
in this journey. Uh, I've shared the details in terms of the team which is present locally in Sri Lanka. Feel free to reach out to them. We'll be more than happy uh, to work with you in that journey where uh, you want to protect your users. Over to you. Thanks, Michael. It was uh, definitely an eye opener for all of us. So, uh, how we would take the rest of the session uh, that uh, we have five eminent speaker panelists in our session. Of course, uh, Michael, you will also join the panel. And uh, the listeners, as you all know, that uh, this is going live on Facebook of ICCSL uh, pet page as well as. Uh, questions uh, you can post it on there and uh, we will pick it up and ask from the panelist if you can address this question to a specific person then uh, that would be great so for, first of all let me introduce the uh, five uh, panelists who are on with us today and then thereafter we'll start the session so the first panelist i would like to introduce is uh, oshadha senanayaka is the current uh, of Sri Lanka and also newly appointed uh, the chairman of the ICT agency of Sri Lanka. And also he is a board member of the uh, SL CERT, uh, Apex body for cybersecurity and digitization uh, process in the country. Uh, Oshita previously headed multiple uh, startup ventures which uh, included a diversified portfolio, which focus, focus on technology, facility management, other businesses, interests such as research on smart battery technology. With strategizing and building partnerships as his core skills, Oshadha consulted and mentors multiple technology-based startups, being at the forefront of executing many successful digital transformation strategies predominantly in the banking, finance sector, and blue chips in Sri Lanka. Uh, next, uh, Madhu is an executive vice president, global chief information officer, and center head for Sri Lanka, advanced technology center at Virtusa. Madhu joins Virtusa as its inception and has been a member of the global executive leadership team that led Virtusa's growth from startup stage to 2 billion NASDAQ listed public company with 24,000 plus team members today. Madhu leads all aspects of Virtusa's digital strategy and focus on building Virtusa's industry leading digital platform to accelerate client service delivery with growth over 20% CAGR over last seven years. He is accomplished C-suite executive leader with deep experience in Envision digital uh, strategy, business transformation, and growth, industry leading growth in global high-tech and financial service companies. Next uh, speaker is uh, we have uh, Indika Disoiza. Indika is a seasoned, vibrant, and result oriented professional with 27 years of uh, rich experience covering digital, ICT solutions, marketing, innovation, development, integration, and market development with prestigious Avi Technologies Lanka Private Limited. In this role, Indika is responsible for Sri Lanka's Huawei enterprise business and provides leadership to the inter enterprise business group. Prior to his role, Indika was a senior consultant at ICT agency of Sri Lanka. At ICT, Indika was responsible for providing leadership to its team of managers and staff to drive country's vision of transforming Sri Lanka towards creative knowledge-based society through digitally empowered citizens. Indika worked at Intel Corporation as a country business manager, Sri Lanka for 15 years. Further, Indika is a vice chair of ICT Skills Council of Sri Lanka, 
Vice Chair of uh, Federation of Information Technology Industry, Sri Lanka, known as FITIS, and a council member of the Computer Society of Sri Lanka. Uh, is uh, Nisal Kodipili, Chief Information Officer of the Union Bank. Uh, he's instrumental in driving significant information technology and digital transformation strategies in banks during a career spanning over 20 years. He has made extensive contribution to the sector through roles of, of as a former chairman of the bank CIO Forum in Sri Lanka. And as a the computer security incident response team known as FIN CSAT. So the next one, we have uh, Akfash Latib, Latibu from Microsoft Sri Lanka. Akfash is a seasoned IT professional with 15 plus years of experience with the Microsoft ecosystem in Southeast Asia. At present, Akfash looks, at, looks into the modern workstation area of organizations to digitally transform into a secure hybrid workplace to increase productivity and profitability. Akfash has been a Microsoft most valuable professional for 10 consecutive years and has a number of certificates under him. He's also a solution focused technology advisor and broad-based experience and has on skills on various technology. Now that you have, uh, I have introduced the five speakers and I know uh, our, uh, one speaker, Oshada, has mentioned that he has to run to the ICD board meeting at four o'clock. Let me release you first and ask you a question, uh, Oshada. Now, we know the government is doing, going on a, a high uh, digitizing uh, drive or uh, digital transformation, especially on the government agencies. And uh, I would is working up and how, where the security is uh, included in it. And also uh, how would the government face the new normal? Thank you, Boshan, and indeed the privilege to be part of this eminent panel uh, discussing this apt theme of uh, cybersecurity and its implication on this um, new COVID-induced new normal. Um, so I'll answer your question in, in, in exact specifics, Boshan. Um, so the first one is, how does the government look at, look, looking at the digital transfer? Uh, well, as the, uh, the public sector. Now, we are looking at it from a perspective of multi-pronged approach. One is the digital economy, where we are looking at accelerating the startups and empowering the startups to ensure that our that our vision of uh, having a digital economy is realized through the local industry. Now, that has been uh, a fad and a lip service for quite a lot, so long. Uh, we've understood that there are certain changes that has been done uh, on the grassroots level. And we've understood that. And example about the thousand startup program it's imperative that we handhold the startups and we ensure that we create a very healthy um, environment that we accelerate and empower their growth by utilizing their services and their product uh, within Sri Lanka I think it's quite important so one of the key specifics uh, that we've um, uh, taken out um, into the market is the fact that Sri Lankan organizations has to prioritize local products. I think that's one of the key uh, steps that's taken and it, it, it's formalized through sec much as we are looking at a 3 billion mark of um, exports in the ITBPO front, it's very important to understand not only services industry can take us to that mark. Um, I believe that we need to continue to create uh, intellectual property, local IP in terms of products, local products, and this is going to ensure that we go through that uh, by ensuring that we would have in the future Sri Lankan products that's going to uh, cut across different markets globally. Now on the next point is the digital government. How are we going to basically transform or digitally transform that the uh, private sector is uh, displaying? I see this in a point where we need to ensure that the government sector, the public sector should not be an impeding point or a bottleneck 
on this acceleration. And I believe we need to keep up with the private sector on this front as well. And in this sense, we've ensured that we have a very pragmatic approach of ensuring that we transform this organization with a well-defined maturity model to understand exactly where each government sector and each government uh, organization is on. on Uh, the digital transformation cannot be uh, done within one night. There's every st there, there are particular steps. The first step is digitization, and then you move on to digitalization, and then digital transformation. Interestingly, not a lot of people even know the difference between digitization and digitalization, although there's a minor uh, difference on those two words, but there's a significant change. So um, in this front, ICTA is taking the lead role in ensuring that we are, we, we are accelerating uh, these attempts and unifying these attempts uh, to align with the national plan. Where we've seen there's been so much of attempts by uh, organizations and sectors in silos. But what we're trying to do right now is to ensure that we are going to have a unified approach uh, through the national uh, digital transformation strategy and each of these agencies are aligned. And the third but uh, not least is the digital services we are going to offer to ensure that we accelerate all of these attempts through the ICT as well. And we are only not looking through the ICT on this digital transformation motion. Uh, we are bringing in the other entities as well. For example, the team the most imperative piece for digital transformation, which is the connectivity piece. As you will all know, um, there's no digitalization that could be meaningfully done if we don't fix the digital divide and the digital connectivity piece. And that's what we are doing through the TRC. If I wear my DG uh, TRC hat on that front, um, we have a quite a, quite a uh, well articulated uh, strategy moving forward for national broadband expansions um, through the Gamata Sanivedaniya project. We have seen on the update that uh, we are taking a national level uh, on this. We figured out um, this digital divide is completely scattered around the whole of Sri Lanka. So we need to look at a whole of country approach on this. And as you see right now, um, we are taking the Rathapur district first. We have about 38 uh, tower infrastructures coming up. So what we've done is motion. We've gone on a data driven model here. We've understood exactly where the gaps are and we've identified what sort of uh, infrastructure that has to come in to uh, ensure that we remove that gap. And that's how we worked in tandem with the telecommunication operators. Uh, and we moved on to the uh, areas of uh, Kurunagala, Mathura, uh, and as we speak, we've started kicked off uh, proceedings in the Northern Front as well with Jaffna. So it's a very well uh, orchestrated effort that's ongoing. And we are now seamlessly going to uh, harmonize it with the activities of the ICTA. We believe that this should go hand in hand. Now, as we talk about all of this, I think the cybersecurity aspect is quite important. Uh, and then uh, we are very serious about the cybersecurity readiness of the country as well. And we've taken uh, significant um, steps in ensuring as much as we are focusing on the digitalization, as you would know, Boshan, um, the, the, the phenomena of ensuring that a whole economy is working today almost online and our students and our next generation studying from home, for example, is giving us a new realm of uh, challenges on the uh, cybersecurity front. And I think um, um, I should admit that uh, we are at a less amount of maturity in terms of cybersecurity readiness. If you look at uh, uh, our government sector, for example. So for example, the reputation risk of defacement of government agency and private organization websites, uh, you'd have seen happening uh, quite um, re recently, but we've mitigated it. We are working on mitigating it. And more importantly, we need to ensure that we secure our critical information infrastructure. For example, uh, we all remember a, a situation where, you know, just last year, there was a whole day of uh, blackout for electricity. Imagine a blackout uh, of all our ATM systems and our critical information infrastructure due to a cyber attack on a country level, right? And we've seen a lot of countries facing it. So we are taking a lot of um, steps on mitigating it and I'll explain how we are going to do with that. And also we are going to face a lot of issues of um, uh, when we are looking at the investment perspective, we are talking about uh, setting uh, Sri Lanka as a hub for investment for technology and innovation. And that's going to impact our national credit ratings. That's going to impact our digital readiness. So uh, it's important that we take these um, critical steps in ensuring uh, that we increase our cybersecurity readiness. Now, what have we done on this? Uh, we've done quite a few steps on that. One aspect is um, bolstering our archaic um, uh, uh, legal platforms, the legal structures. As you would know right now, we're at the last stages of bringing the cybersecurity bill. It's at the last stage of draft. 
I believe that's going to be a, a pivotal point and an inflection point in terms of uh, ensuring we increase our readiness. The data protection bill is also coming through very important for all of us as the public in ensuring that our rights of information and right of data is protected. Um, it's working along quite well. And more importantly, as I mentioned, we are island nation. And uh, if you're going to be a technology hub, we need to ensure resilient global connectivity infrastructure. Now, um, I'm proud to state that two weeks back, Sri Lanka was the first in Asia to come up with a, a submarine cable resilience program uh, in tandem with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the UNODC, as well as, uh, the, well as Japan, which have been um, helping us. And we've done the first draft framework to roll out to ensure that we have a very strong submarine cable resilience program that uh, the rest of the Asia currently doesn't even have. So we are looking at it in a very, very broader holistic perspective as never before. And I think uh, the fact that the cybersecurity bill is coming along, it's going to bolster how we look at cybersecurity from a point of right now we have the CERT. Uh, Madhu and I are colleagues, board colleagues at the CERT. But once the cybersecurity bill comes through, we are, we are going to transform the CERT into a much more stronger uh, mechanism and institute of a cybersecurity agency. Now, this is going to have a lot more mandate in terms of driving through uh, the national uh, cybersecurity uh, requirements. Um, based on the steps that we've taken, I'm indeed the proud to state today, um, there are two indices that I can refer back as examples. Um, based on the National Cybersecurity Index done by Estonia, as you all know, Estonia is a um, uh, case in point of digitalization. We've been uh, on the 90th position uh, a few years back in terms of cybersecurity readiness. But 2021, um, uh, after a lot of concerted efforts in ensuring alignment of all the government agencies and ensuring we put in frameworks, we've come from uh, a position of 98 um, to 69th position as a country. So I think that's a significant achievement. And also the International Telecommunication Union um, a report on the Global uh, National Cybersecurity Index. We've been um, uh, on the 85th place. We've, we've also increased by one rank within the year on year on year, and we are now on the uh, 84th rank. And uh, from a regional perspective, we are on the 15th. So of course, we have a lot to improve on yet. Um, but what I can assure you, uh, Boshan, is uh, we are well on our way. Um, the fact that we are looking at all of these ancillaries and key pedantics in a detailed manner, I think will set us in good tone in ensuring that Sri Lanka truly achieves uh, digital transformation, uh, which is realistic as well as sustainable. And, and I believe, uh, personally believe that Sri Lanka's future is dependent on this digital transformation where we need to basically uh, cut across uh, global economies by providing um, providing our services from a digital, um, digital innovation perspective, as well as ensuring that we are a smart nation and a digital society. So there's a lot of uh, aspects coming through, Bhushan. So I know I, I have a um, small amount of minutes, but I've compressed a lot of information and I, and I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Oshida. I think, yes, within a very short period of time that you managed to give us a government perspective in the digital transformation. I just want to, since we have limited time with you, uh, Oshida, maybe I'll ask a few questions before I pass it on to the other guys, because others will probably have another one now or so with us. Uh, I, I, I was very happy to hear this Kamata Sannivedanaya program that what you mentioned. So in that program, we know now all the students are doing uh, online teaching and online learning. So would this program support the school children also in terms of online? Now we see in the, in the media that some of the children are climbing rocks or the trees or in terms of trying to get the connectivity. And some, of course, do not have the devices also. How would children be supported uh, in this program? So, Boshan, thank you for bringing up this question and for me to answer that, right? It's an interesting case study of how we integrate, right? Now, this question of uh, the fact that our children are on the wayside uh, trying to basically latch on to 4G and even getting on top of mountains to things, it is really happening. But we should also understand the fact that um, COVID was a forced induce, induction of uh, digitalization. And it was a dark swan event, which no one of us predicted. But I think uh, it's not an excuse. I see it as a positive where uh, we, we've got opportunity to digitalize and transform very fast. Now, what are we doing on that incident? Absolutely, yes, Boshan. Um, the government of Sandy Medina, or if we translate it to English, is called Connect Sri Lanka Project. Um, it is uh, in line with the Connect 2030 agenda of the International Telecommunication Union. So interestingly, what we are doing here, Boshan, is not just a coordination effort done by the TRC or the government. 
we are in fact investing on the telecommunication infrastructure by the service providers by the telecom telecommunication development levy unfortunately this has not happened for the last 12 to 13 years and for the first time right now we are investing on the rural areas and and the whole context of having a telecom development levy is for the exact reason of um, uh, ensuring that we empower the industry to go and cover the rural areas that for them maybe it doesn't make financial sense but for a government it absolutely makes a lot of economic sense now with in line with that portion what we've done is we haven't just stopped at just giving infrastructure for 4g and fiber um, we have moved on to ensure with the operators um, we've completely made it free almost all the e-learning platforms uh, of all all students if you look at the education sector right now with icta and the ministry of education we ensure that the taxalava so that is the official e-learning platform right now mandated by the government uh, we uh, made it formal uh, in February through a cabinet paper uh, to ensure that everyone goes through a very unified approach on this. Uh, uh, we should be proud to the fact that this is a model based uh, platform that is completely built in Sri Lanka. So this gives a first intent of adopting Sri Lankan uh, know how right and then locally built and then it's going to save us a lot of foreign expenditure now this ethaxel our platform while we've been working with the ministry of education from icta perspective in ensuring we ramp it up for 10000 school we've ensured from a trc perspective we have made it completely free of charge to access so today from grade 1 to 13 portion any any student or any parent or any uh, uh, teacher that goes on to the ethaxel portal not a cent is charged on data so your child my child can and even consume 10 hours of videos on the Taxalava Bodal platform, there won't be any data consumed. In fact, I'm, I'm very excited to say that uh, within a year, we have about a 4 million, uh, 4 million hits on the Taxalava portal, and also terabytes of data consumed on a free of charge mode. And we have not only start, uh, stopped their abortion, we moved on to the university system. So for the university, is the, um, the, the key uh, e-learning uh, network is the Learn. Uh, the learn um, e-learning platform that's on also completely whitelisted now interestingly these are the things that the media doesn't mention right um, and i think as we move along it's important that we understand and i think we are world first uh, on the last asia pacific telecommunication conference sri lanka was appreciated and nepal and another country actually inquired on how we implemented this free of charge access to the whole of our next generation and um, we have also pressured that portion, not only that, and we moved on to giving special packages, you know, for study from homes, right? Today, we can get 100 GBs at about 495 rupees. That gives you a GB at about uh, less than five rupees, whereas parents and, and, and children had to pay 100 plus for extra GB, for example. So um, the interesting point is rather than uh, we um, basically uh, uh, talk about ourselves, the International Telecommunication Union latest report portion on, on affordability, for data has um, taken us so 2020 the later 2021 you can go to the itu um, uh, and then uh, download this information we have come to the top 20 of data affordability across all countries we won the 29th place uh, last year so we moved up nine ranks uh, so we are the 20th cheapest for data and these are normalized as per the gdp as well and also for voice rates you'd be surprised to note that we've tracked into the top 10 we are the seventh cheapest in the world right now for voice services right in sri lanka but I believe we need to still continue abortion, right? I mean, we have a lot of inequality. 80% of Sri Lanka is basically rural still, right? So we need to continue cutting across. So what we believe is these efforts um, through a multi-pronged approach across multiple organizations, the TRC, the ICTA, the Ministry of Education. I mean, these, the, these are fantastic example of a whole of government approach abortion, right? And as you said, yes, um, everyone talks about uh, the issue, but uh, not many people talk about the attempts made and the steps taken, and even the statistics that's out there, which is which speaks for itself, you know. So these are some of the key steps. And last but not least, we are moving a cabinet paper. I will break this news today on this uh, forum. We are, as part of the Connect Sri Lanka or the Government Sun Within program, is we are moving a cabinet paper to ensure we fiberize all 10,130 schools. Right, and we, we have a very bold approach of ensuring that we do it within a year. It's very bold, it's very pragmatic, I know, very idealistic, but we are very confident we can do that. And once we do that, uh, I believe the next step is, as you say, is the device enablement. So that's the last piece of digital transformation that we need. So that we need to work along together in ensuring that we do that. But connectivity piece is done. We've got the solution in piece to the uh, ETHAX lab right now. The last piece we are going to have is pretty much uh, the device enablement piece that we are working on. And then there's a lot of countries that has uh, extended their support and uh, conveyed their extension of support. So I believe we us to be uh, 
a country that could really transform the complete education sector uh, and, uh, and i'm pretty confident that we can achieve it and then uh, i would invite all of the industries that's connected today also to be part of this journey and then i think we can achieve it together thank you very much uh, and also i think uh, our viewership has just increased of you breaking the news uh, so there'll be people who want to rewind and see what the, what the breaking news is so thank you very much for that. Just one question, Oshad, I think uh, this would help you even being at the TRC. There's a lot of uh, negative impact going around the 5G technology in the social media. So, uh, I mean, uh, what would you say about the 5G technology and coming about? Are there any health uh, issues or not? So, Boshan, um, I'll, I'll put this back at uh, uh, anybody who asked this. There's never been uh, uh, even an exact um, a measurement of impact on health on 4G connectivity. When we look at 5G, um, it consumes 80% less um, uh, power, for example, right? Which sums up the radiation levels are lower. Um, I would say this, this phenomena is brought by different uh, geopolitical reasons, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global race towards who's going to be the champions of 5G, and it's an interesting race. Um, and I believe there are di different rhetoric. We call this astroturfing, right, in digital marketing. So there's a lot of astroturfing being created on this front. Um, but let me say this, Boshan, I think the five, 5G is going to be um, the game changer uh, in terms of the IR4 and even um, for us as countries, because look, 5G is not only going to give us only faster broadband uh, download rates, right? So there are three tenets of 5G. One is basically ultra level low latency, URLLC. That's going to be critical when we talk about smart cities, smart nations, um, IoT-based um, uh, uh, applications that's going to accelerate and, and uh, ensure that the experience we get as citizens is changed. I'll give you one example. In, on 4G, if you take uh, a sensorial data on a square kilometer on 4G, you can get about 64,800 uh, IoT devices connected, right? That's at max uh, 4G LTE plus can manage. On 5G, it goes up to a staggering 1 million uh, sensor devices that can be within one square kilometer area, right? So this is going to be one of the key catalysts if you're going to talk about a smart country, right? And we talk about a smart Sri Lanka, right? And the next is the massive, massive machine type uh, communication, MMTC, right? Um, autonomous vehicles, you know, smart traffic light systems. We all know how we curse our traffic light systems, right? It's got to be smart, right? I mean, it's got to change depending on the traffic flows, but why cannot it happen, right? Um, so this is real. I mean, the 5G, what's going, what it's going to uh, is real. Uh, and the last but not least is the uh, enhanced mobile broadband connectivity, EMBCC. So, I mean, it's not only just one facet portion we need to understand. Um, again, coming back to um, uh, health uh, issues, it's, it's the world is divided on it. So I would rather say you need to do your own uh, 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 assessments on it. I know there's been, um, you know, films and all that that's uh, instigated this, for example, in Jaffna, right? I mean, there's been an incident where one operator goes into Jaffna to set up the 5G and it ended up in the court and, and uh, um, the, the industry has won the court case, right? But what 5G can offer is uh, far more superior and we need to understand it. Um, what are we doing in Sri Lanka again? We've started 5G um, uh, trials as early as uh, January 20, uh, 20, January 2020, as soon as I took over. Right now we have in almost 75 locations, 5G free of charge. If you have a 5G um, device on your hand, you can consume it. Um, we are looking at also um, uh, auctioning the spectrum towards the end of the year uh, in terms of 5G. So I believe, look, I mean, it, it's a divided um, perspective with Boshan, but I believe um, it's going to cut across like any new technology, you know, um, there's going to be conspiracy theories, there's going to be divided opinion, but I believe we'll, we'll, we'll come to, to um, uh, uh, concise point as we move along. Thank you, Oshuda. Uh, may I ask anyone who's in the panelist have any questions to Oshuda before we release him or any clarifications on what he mentioned? All right, seems like no questions. You are, you are very loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much, Oshada, being with us. I know you are a very, very busy person. Now two roles on your head. So uh, once again, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us and also the Sri Lankan community in terms of up updating what the government perspective and what the future is going to be like and what's a new normal 
from the government uh, uh, digital transformation. Thank you once again, Ashita. Thank, Thank you. All right. So with that, may I come to uh, Madhu? So we heard a lot of uh, local stuff. I would like to ask from Madhu that, you know, with this global uh, pandemic and uh, what is the global perspective uh, in this uh, new normal challenge and also uh, the cybersecurity with the, like, you know, from, I, I would say from 2019, December or November started in Wuhan. Now it's, we don't see an end to it even for the next two years, I would say. So uh, what are the challenges that the global companies are facing and uh, where would we go? Yeah, thanks, Boshan. I think that's a great question. Um, if you really look at what had happened in the last year and a half, um, it, it certainly a lot of trends that have been happening gradually, like working from home to uh, you know digitalization had got accelerated, right? You've seen, you've heard, probably seen the a message going around, you know, who drove the digital transformation, whether it's a CEO, CIO, or COVID, right? And most companies obviously would have uh, jumped in and you can see there's a rapid uh, transformation happening. Banks are trying to enable transactions, you know, supermarket chains are trying to enable, you know, uh, e-commerce. A lot of the consumer-facing technology companies or consumer-facing companies have adapted technology dramatically, right? So I think we have seen firstly, huge wave of digitalization and and with as a result of that we have a lot more mobile uh, applications a lot more cloud applications a lot more iot as we spoke of uh, and and a lot more remote workers right what has this done to cybersecurity is that it incrementally or, or exponentially had uh, increased the threat landscape right there's a lot more attack surface now out there and then a lot more things can go wrong Right? because you can now get attacked. You know, if you think about a company who is working inside office to maybe you have 100 people inside the office, now when you go out 100 people outside, obviously you, you, know, you multiply your threat landscape by 100, you know, 100 uh, times, right? So there's a huge increase in threat landscape. That's one uh, big uh, trend that we see, right? The second issue, I think, second challenge is that uh, as uh, David also talked about, or Michael also talked about, the, the attackers have got sophisticated, right? They have, you know, just like uh, companies are adv using advanced technology, these companies are using now, attackers are using AI and automation and uh, a lot of that technology is getting used to attack, right? And then I think uh, Michael talked about, you can go and even subscribe, get a service to attack others, right? Well, uh, like a ransomware. So that is a second big issue, right? The, the attackers are getting, Lot more sophisticated they are getting large in number so that kind of a precipitate the problem the third is what's happening uh, to regulation right around the governments around the world including sri lanka india and and many part of asia they're getting a lot more serious about data protection and data security right you know you can you you see uh, uh, osha talked about cyber security bill and uh, a data protection bill uh, and these put a lot of very serious liability on companies who handle data, right? So, so there is again another big driver uh, that companies have to adapt. The same thing went on in Europe uh, with the GDPR. There were you know huge shift in how people handle data and and the repercussions of not handling it properly, right? So that's a that's a third I think uh, uh, massive trend that we see. The fourth is the, the, the real sheer lack of uh, qualified cybersecurity professionals, right? You know, it's a huge talent shortage uh, around the world. Uh, even, if you want, if you, even if you want to do something, it, there is not enough talent available out there, right? So, so these four drivers, I think, is creating a perfect storm right now when you come to cybersecurity, right? I think uh, so it's very important that companies start and governments start really looking at this and accelerating this focus around cybersecurity, because you know it, it's a it's a massive business risk, massive uh, national risk that we are really in front of. So, so this is what's going on. I think we, you know, this is a great conversation that we are having today. So, how do you address that? I think hopefully we'll talk about a few ideas as we go. But this is the this is the backdrop that I think we are all kind of uh, marching into with the COVID accelerated uh, you know threat landscape that we are trying to uh, work on, right? So that's uh, uh, that's a bit of the background. 
Thanks, Madhu. Uh, just before I move on to the next one, now, uh, into, see, now with this COVID-19, the uh, organizations which they have maybe uh, two to three years uh, digital transformation strategy probably would have jumped into the digital transformation within a couple of months. So uh, have, do you see that they ignore the security part of it at this point of time because they want to do, be in business than being out of business? Uh, what do you see in the, 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 the trend like? They have forgotten security when they go into the digital right now because of this COVID-19? Uh, unfortunately, uh, security still is an afterthought for a lot of companies, right? And if you look at the, uh, you know, I think uh, Michael talked about some numbers, right? And I think I've seen similar numbers out there. There has been a 600% increase in cyber attacks in the last 12 months, right? So that's a massive uptake, right? One is the threat landscape, obviously, but the other is that people haven't really taken uh, um, security by design approach to some of these things, right? And uh, so it's, I think, very crucial uh, aspect that I, I think there isn't enough due focus is given, you know, you know, you are rushing to put something out there, you're rushing to create an experience for your users and uh, accessibility for your services. And cybersecurity, unfortunately, still is a still is a afterthought, right? And I think a lot of the threats today, uh, or a lot of the vulnerabilities today, are not uh, big vulnerabilities, like I think Michael talked about that uh, colonial pipeline uh, incident, it's, it's about, uh, you know, weak credentials, right? And, and a lot of these issues are like weak credentials, you know, not patching your systems fast enough, right? And, and not doing configurations properly, and especially in the cloud. A huge issue is about misconfigurations in, in, in cloud access. So these are the, the, the real issues are still what cre creates this huge challenges are caused by some hygiene stuff that people are not doing, right? And or, or not taken uh, enough focus on. So I think, yes, I, I think very clearly they, there isn't enough focus, there's enough uh, attention. It's not a, for most companies, it hasn't become a board topic, uh, executive topic, and increasingly people are getting it there. But this is a, like a CEO boardroom conversation for a lot of the global companies now. And I think we have to follow suit fast and set the tone because your business is at risk. If you don't. I, I think it's a top-down approach. Absolutely. Uh, Right. So, uh, Mark, I'll come back to a few more questions, but uh, before that, let me ask a question uh, from Nisela. Nisela, I mean, you're in the financial service industry, and I'm sure you are. You have more challenges in this industry uh, than I would say anyone else, because I mean, uh, the whole system where you everyone come into one location and then you meet, you have the perimeter defenses. So now you have to open that and let people access the IT infrastructure or maybe sometimes the co-banking systems remotely. So uh, in the financial service industry, what challenges do you feel that they're going to be with this uh, uh, COVID-19 and uh, in the new normal? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Vashan. So, uh, um, so like, as I said, basically before the pandemic, we are predominantly like a, uh, the uh, employees come to work and we work from office. There's no like uh, remote working sort of environment for us. And uh, the remote access was simply limited to the IT admin staff, like in order to attend for any urgent technical issues, which may occur after office hours. But, uh, and uh, in like many cases, our the systems, if you look at what was open outside was the email, right? Uh, so then, uh, also, like uh, the like I said, the general IT infrastructure for the workforce is designed uh, uh, using like uh, uh, working for a uh, inside uh, work workforce, not for a remote working. Uh, the workforce uh, uh, generally bank will not have, and uh, so the those infrastructure was not uh, like uh, geared to uh, take over a large uh, user community. So. Uh, with the pandemic, what happened basically, may, uh, the most of the organization required to implement solution for their staff to work from home. And that was the biggest challenge even the uh, uh, financial sector uh, uh, faced during this uh, pandemic. And uh, 
uh, the other factor is basically with the lockdowns and everything coming in, uh, this was uh, almost a requirement uh, where overnight we have to set it up all the uh, the what are the available infrastructure uh, uh, to support the remote working forces and uh, uh, the other thing uh, which what happened basically like everyone uh, the event madhu and the uh, the osha the said the uh, the digital transformation strategies were advanced by multiple folds due to the pandemic so like uh, we were pushing for our digital transformation journeys uh, uh, with the like uh, users and the management tunnel. But I mean, all of a sudden, everybody start uh, uh, seeing the importance of digital transformation. And so it was uh, like advanced by multiple folds. folds. And also with the, we have seen in the, even the banking sector that a lot of uh, digital immigrants like who are uh, sort of a fearful of uh, using digital transformation uh, technologies also started using technology for their day-to-day -day needs since uh, access to bank branches were restricted due to lockdowns and all. So, I mean, that was the challenge which we faced uh, during the pandemic. And uh, like, uh, if I talk about the uh, cyber security risk in this aspect, uh, so uh, due to the nature of the business financial institution, institutions are anyway, like had a large exposure to the cyber risks. So this has been uh, further stressed with the global uh, the pandemic and where the uh, cyber threat landscape has been even more like so diverse and given more opportunity to the cyber criminals. So, uh, uh, so main reason basically if you look at the increase, the exposure of the cyber, the threats for the uh, the sector was the sudden change of the implementation of a work for, workforce uh, where working from home landscape where the infrastructure and the uh, the, uh, the whatever the like uh, limitations which we had immediately so but I mean see now the I, I would I believe that everyone nice uh, it's it's nothing new so it's already it geared for this sort of a uh, the uh, challenge so this is what uh, happened during uh, the uh, financial sector if i talk about Russia. thanks thanks uh, also just one question now uh, we know i mean especially during this uh, covid 19 period where yeah. the banks also running on uh, limited staff yeah. and encouraging customers uh, not to visit to the bank but use all online facilities available yeah uh, i mean so a result that we see is that a lot of people are sending emails, giving uh, bank instructions on fund transfers and other related uh, instructions. Yeah. You see that uh, at least in Sri Lanka, there is some kind of email spoofing taking place and uh, hackers exploiting this uh, opportunity. Yeah, of course. I mean, we have seen a lot of uh, the recent past uh, in the, like my experiences, so we have seen a lot of uh, if spoofing is happening and generally unless like uh, you have a indemnity signed with the bank we don't take the uh, the email instructions so generally we encourage the all the users to use your digital channels like your mobile banking application or internet uh, the banking application to give the instructions to the bank so uh, we, we we are we as a, uh, we, we are very careful of uh, taking email instructions unless like say the if you even we do verify the the customer we don't take generally the email uh, sort of instructions because of the uh, problem which we have in our hand right okay um, thanks Isala. so let me uh, post the question to uh, indica uh, from huawei technologies so, Hindika, this, uh, do you see that uh, technology is been evolving, uh, taking uh, COVID-19 as an issue, or, or is it going at a, a normal space? Uh, what, what, what do you see in the industry? I think it's it's evident that the technology is evolving, obviously, right? So the what uh, Nisala spoke or Madhu spoke, even um, uh, Oshad was talking about the adaption which is in, happening in the country when you're looking at these examples. Uh, technology is evolving because again, what has happened was uh, the demand has, or the, the from a customer point of view, or the user point of view, demand has increased. 
Uh, so, I mean, some of the new things has actually coming into the system, right? So uh, we have now started using words like working from home or what do you call a teleworker, uh, online education, or we call it blended learning, uh, online medical treatment. These have become like, you know, very normal to us, which is we would have done these things in like, you know, very smaller patches, right? Like, you know, some of us who have been working in a, a multinational environment or like, you know, flex hours, what do we call it? We have been very much used to this environment, but when you're looking at, or oh, we take example of a government employee or a Sri Lankan context or globally, uh, possibly this is something really new. Now, now with this demand has increased, maybe from a telecom company point of view, uh, what the services they need to give, what Nisal was talking from a banking point of view, the services they need to give uh, has changed. Like, you know, the example what Nisal took is about their only IT team had remote access to uh, address an issue, right? So uh, one of the reports which is Gartner released very recently, it's talking about uh, after the COVID-19 situation or the last couple of years, uh, one and a half years as such, they're estimating about 41% of the people are working from home uh, in the uh, working world, right? Probably, I don't think uh, it might much have changed uh, right now. Uh, and with this changeover, the demand for the technology has got increased. Uh, so it can be from a device point of view, network point of view. Uh, and also, uh, as all of us were discussing about, like, you know, security has become afterthought uh, on this because your network get expanded people getting remotely getting expanded and you need to have a very robust uh, like a, what do you call a uh, the security system in your uh, like you know in your environment otherwise people can uh, breach in so the example what michael took right on the us what has happened on a on the weaker password somebody managed to hack in uh, so as of like you know some of the things i talk about the teleworking or online education etc uh, again that same Gartner reports actually talking about uh, the uh, the breaches which is happening so involvement of technology again similar angle you need to make sure like you know you need to have the security side of is uh, getting um, uh, richer so we uh, we in the previous speakers we heard about the ransomware the data breaches etc which is coming in and how the these attackers also are getting more ma much smarter or they come up with new new uh, innovative ways so uh, one of the stats actually was talking about spoken about is uh, last year it spoke about like you know who itself which is like you know a critical point for us in the current environment has uh, suffer, suffered like you know more than five times uh, on uh, attacks or the breaches coming into the uh, system so it can be couple of hundred i mean like you know couple of large percentages which is all all this is happening so when you're looking at it uh, again technology getting adapted adapted in the environment uh, which is now estimated about 61% of the CIOs uh, was like, you know, looking at all like, you know, increase in their investments uh, in the information technology. So uh, it's it's no longer like, you know, it is like, you know, looking at a three or a four year plan of uh, the technology transformation actually coming into the thing, which is we need to do it today because otherwise you may go out of business if you are not connected uh, with the real uh, world. So uh, one more point I will add on here, like, you know, so uh, to be in the digital and the intelligent world, we do call it, right? So uh, technology is like 5G, uh, cloud, uh, AI, um, all this is coming into the action more and more. So with development of technology. So again, your need for having uh, what you call a uh, stable cyberspace uh, uh, criticality uh, is, is coming in. So this is definitely become a more of a shared responsibility from a corporate point of view, government point of view, or a political point of view. So also those who spoke about as a nation, how we are getting ready about the Cyber Security Act and the data protection law, which is coming in. So these are strengthening, I think timely uh, decisions are taken on how uh, the, from a country point of view, it is getting strengthened. I mean, if you are working in a local environment, we need to look at, and it's, it's timely that like, you know, um, our corporate environments also getting adapted to this security protocols etc to make sure the organization is safe as well as your customers are safe thanks indica, uh, indica now in this uh, technology evolution uh, that you i mean coming that you see it's happening anyway probably yep. at a large as well, much faster than it used to now uh, in in security in terms of this is it as uh, Madhu said, is it an uh, afterthought or is it, are they embedding security into the technology evolution as well? 
so with the with my understanding actually it it, it is still i don't think I, I i we can still call it as a bit of afterthought but when you took uh, uh, two years ago versus right now the security is considered uh, or like you know it is now in a much higher level law it is considered very seriously because uh, the, the when you when you do a digitalization plan or when you digitizing an organization two years back probably security would have come like you know last few uh, items in your agenda but since now a lot of people are remotely working your customers are remotely logging in a lot of services are taking remotely uh, it is become a priority right now so one of the challenges maybe globally also there's a shortage of uh, security specialized uh, people or the human resource like you know even if you take a nation i mean as a country sri lanka maybe if you talk to somebody like madhu we'll tell like you know the challenges uh, companies like him or nisala will say like you know we want to get such expertise uh, we have challenges right so now the ecosystem need to align these people has to be produced and uh, things has to be come into place so i think uh, as i mentioned before also like it it is being seriously considered that's maybe the reason the the what also the said like you know as a nation we are pushing for these uh, policies or the regulations coming in faster uh, and organizations coming up with uh, the security policy is very strict um, uh, password maybe uh, if you are using your password maybe for a lifetime all right uh, in the earlier day now maybe you have a security like you know which is a i don't know every one and a half months uh, you have to change your password or update certain policies has been implemented and your vpn how you log in etc is been considered i think a lot of security protocol has been done like you know say uh, since like you know since nisal was talking about the digital banking side uh, we can see the banks are coming with more uh, stringent uh, like you know protocols or password etc which is we need to come in uh, because this has to be strengthened and policies has to be strengthened obviously thanks indira so uh, akash thank you for waiting patiently uh, so for me to post a question to you so akash i mean we, we all know now today i mean the, all the speakers including michael uh and also the panelists were talking about this uh, hybrid workplaces and also i think uh, michael in his presentation was also were talking about zero trust approach now these all been done to uh, safeguard your organization from cyber attacks now uh, i i mean what challenges do you see i mean your expertise is also into that transforming organizations into hybrid workplaces and make it more uh, efficient and profitable as i read your profile so how do you see these challenges and then uh, how do you see these two key words hybrid workplace and zero trust uh, in the new normal see i mean thank you so much uh, uh, boshan for posting that question and uh, good evening to everyone and like most of the other speakers uh, starting from michael osha the madhu uh, nisala indika right everybody you know made their points you know bang on target so of course the digital transformation journey has expedited i would say right by multiple folds to what we are today with that see things happened overnight organizations did not have the time to plan and execute and do you know like what they do usually you know things um, where companies had to uh, uh, find ways and means for employees to work from home overnight right what do they do you know embracing of tools embracing of new technologies and we ourselves right faced like you know we used to go buy stuff from supermarkets out there every day right but suddenly we also had to go online and do our shopping do our daily runs right so everything changed the way that we think the way that we live the way that we do work and you know buy our stuff and so on so this exposed or this rather uh, uh, pushed every organization to transform the way that they work to 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 uh, uh, make sure that they are, they are uh uh in the race as the competitors also to provide better customer experiences right so with this uh uh the traditional um way of working was also transformed and that's what we call now as hybrid work and of course you know hybrid work will not just go away tomorrow when the situation is done it is going to stay and it is going to be there 
right? So when we look at hybrid work, it's not only about employees connecting from home. It's about some people will connect from home, will work from home. Uh, there would be certain workplaces who would have opened offices, right? So some will be connecting from work or office premises, right? Some might even connect from other geographies that are there. So with this change, organization, organizations are facing, there could be many challenges, including security risks, risks that has come up, right? So now that the uh, uh, we are in the hybrid uh, mode, right? So we no longer expect to access these loads of uh, uh, corporate information uh, solely from uh, uh, office network as well as you know uh, company managed devices. So the traditional, you know, the network and security perimeter model that we had that's disappeared now, right? So where we work, our office premises, everything has evolved so much now that no matter where employees uh, are, access to a variety of tools and data, right, are essentials to be productive. So that's the key, right? So on the other hand, like most of them said, the threat landscape has continued to evolve. Cyber attacks are uh, on the rise. You know, we saw that one of the interesting cases, the colonial pipes that was uh, uh, spoken by uh, 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 Michael earlier. Right. So these cyber attacks are on the rise and keeps increasing, making organizations to lose millions of dollars, market share, they lose customers, reputation, everything. Right. So research also shows that it takes a good 150 plus days for an organization to know that they have been breached sometimes. Right. And an average security breach costs uh, no, somewhere between 1.5 to 2 million dollars. Right. So these are you know, our, our, the, the, the bad actors. They are also finding so many different ways and means from phishing to DDoS attacks to several other methods to penetrate and achieve their motives, right? So to overcome all this, right? In this new normal, what we need is like what Michael also pointed out, a security model, what we call is the zero trust security model, right? That was there, like Michael said, for about 10 years. But you know we need to implement that. So, what does the zero zero trust mean? So, zero trust at its core is instead of believing everything behind the corporate firewall is safe, the zero trust model assumes breach and verifies each request, no matter whether it is coming from home or whether it is coming from your corporate network. Right? It is going to verify. It is going to assume that it is a breach, and it is going to verify every single access that's going to come in. Right. So there are three key principles that happens in a zero trust. First, you uh, uh, verify explicitly, meaning moving from uh, assumption to explicit verification. Always authenticate and authorize based on all available data points, uh, such as your user identity, location, where the user is connecting from, device health, right? The endpoint where the user is connecting from, whether that is healthy or not, right? The applications that the user is accessing, everything, all right? And the second being use least privilege, all right? Access and adopt a policy, right? Where you only give uh, limited access to every user to whatever that they need to have, only need to know basis or need to uh, access level, right? And then finally, assume breach, design with assumption that every element in your system can be breached, right? So end of the day, what everyone, now, now you know, we all know that data is the new oil or gold or whichever it is, right? It's, 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 you know, it's so valuable now for every organization, all right? And there are so much of data that's available. 90% of world's data was created in the last two years, they say, right? So all these people come and penetrate, try to penetrate that and get the data out. So there should be the level of uh, uh, security in between as well as to protect that particular data. Usually it is the identity uh, that gives the gateway to you and the data. Most probably it is the username and a password, but is that enough? That's a question mark, right? If you have multi-factor authentication enabled, that itself will protect almost like 99.9% .9 from a data breach happening, right? So those are certain key areas uh, that the zero trust model will uh, uh, um, 
implement when you really consider uh, identity protection, it will protect your device, it has to protect your data, your application, your network, everything, right? With a policy in the middle, the policy should be there, a centralized policy where when a user connects to the network, using the device that or, or whatever the endpoint that they are using in order to connect to the network and access network or access applications or access uh, some sort of data from the network, wherever they can be, it should always go and query that policy and see, hey, is this user connecting from the usual place or is it from a different IP? Or is he just was connecting about 10 minutes ago from Sri Lanka and then, you know, in the next half an hour, he's connecting from uh, Russia or Germany or somewhere else, right? So those are suspicious activity that happens. So there should be controls, methods, mechanisms to look into all those things and you know uh, 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 provide a solution. And basically, that's zero trust. That I mean, uh, components of zero trust that needs to be uh, looked into in today's new normal. Thanks, Akbash. Uh, Michael, you're there? Yeah, yeah, Boshin. Yeah, I'm very mistaken. Sorry. Uh, Michael, I, so, sorry for the long delay in coming to you, but uh, I have a, actually two questions. Let me post the first question to you. Now, in your presentation, uh, you were mentioning about by 2023 or 2024, there'll be more cloud uh, adaptations uh, than what it is. Now, there is also a, a, a theory among the normal uh, users that when you move to cloud, you don't have to worry about uh, cybersecurity because cloud service provider itself will look after my uh, data in the cloud. So what is the truth behind that? Okay, that's a good uh, question and uh, a myth or a misunderstanding which needs to be cleared for the users. So when we talk about this public cloud, uh, fundamentally what they are offering is they are offering infrastructure as a service. So the infrastructure, the compute, the storage, uh, where you can run your application, uh, you know, uh, do the business, et cetera. Now, whatever you are deploying on that infrastructure, what they are providing needs to be protected by you. And the best example is uh, when you look at some of this uh, compromises or attacks which has happened uh, globally, uh, when it comes to some of them where uh, it was uh, misconfigurations or lack of security on the public cloud where uh, uh, it was not configured properly, maybe the keys, the, 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 the configurations on the public cloud was not done correctly, et cetera, it was uh, misused. So, in terms of securing your data applications on the cloud, it's the responsibility of the user. I do agree that some of the cloud service providers of also offer uh, lots of uh, security solutions, et cetera. But uh, end of the day, the customer needs to decide what's the best uh, uh, suited for the customers. But uh, uh, by default, assuming that uh, when I uh, uh, avail a service from the cloud, uh, that service is secure. So that is not true for sure. Now, in terms of adoption of uh, public cloud and this uh, increase in intake, I'm sure uh, uh, across the globe, uh, that is what we are seeing and that is a valid reason. Uh, while the business, what we have seen even in India uh, during the pandemic, where there was a nationwide lockdown, which was happening, where there was a business requirement of uh, uh, enhancing the capacity for the VPN users because the the VPN gateway solution, what is deployed, which was catering only to a smaller user segment, and now needs to be enhanced so that all the users could connect uh, securely, uh, remotely, etc. Now, there was no uh, possibility of uh, shipping uh, bigger hardware to the customer premises. That logistics of uh, uh, box moving from one location to another location was definitely a challenge. So, what were the options? What we are discussing with the customers? Either the customer could look at uh, where they purchase a, a VM license, a virtual uh, uh, image license for that security solution. And uh, as this is assuming that the customer has some compute power available in this office or in data center, which can be then remotely leveraged to uh, launch this application and then uh, it can be configured and then it can be used by the users. If that was not a use case available with the customer, what we were recommending was 
use a public cloud. The same VM, what the customer is purchasing, uh, rather than deploying it in your data center, if that is not uh, something which was operationally, technically feasible, put it on the public cloud. So all the remote users will then connect to that infrastructure in the public cloud. And from there, through a secure channel, they will connect back to the corporate office. So this was a classic, uh, simple example, what I could uh, uh, sense, which was the need of the hour uh, during the pandemic, uh, where uh, uh, without a, a prior warning or without a prior intimation or proper planning, companies had to get into this kind of modes. Uh, and now with the first pandemic uh, getting over, now the companies are working on a bigger strategy in terms of uh, 70, 20, 80, 30, uh, 70, 30 or 80, 20 kind of, uh, or, or no, 50, 50 kind of a works, workforce uh, teleworker uh, infrastructure. They are planning, they are planning to deploy it on the long term, et cetera, but in the short term. So this was the cloud solutions or the way how the cloud could have been leveraged in that crisis situation. But definitely with this pandemic, uh, even the companies who have not even looked at adopting cloud, they have understood the necessity of where cloud can be used and why it becomes important from an availability business continuity perspective. And definitely that's going to continue is what uh, uh, the, the, the trend says and uh, we also firmly believe in that. Thanks, my guess. You know, in terms of the, like, you know, the percentage wise, uh, what is the responsibility of the customer and uh, in percentage wise, what is the responsibility of the cloud service provider? Is it 50-50 or is uh, a different? So if I just take an example of a public cloud, I don't want to name the CSPs, but if you take the common public yeah. cloud, uh, you go and buy your infrastructure there and then you're going to install the application and uh, on that application, there could be uh, data residing, it could be sensitive, non-sensitive data, but it could be business related. Now, maintaining that application and that data, what is going to reside in the public cloud, 100% responsibility of security or securing the data lies with the end user and not with the cloud provider. So the cloud providers also provides additional security uh, tools to secure your data or else you could look at uh, buying third-party solutions even for example when you look at it uh, if you look at the marketplace of any of this uh, csps you will see uh, fortinet most of the product lines available in the marketplace from where you can consume it as well right thanks michael there's another question i'll come back to you after posting uh how do i like to post these questions to you uh I mean, as we all agree, this accelerated digitization process had created a lot of data. I think more data than uh, you and I could ever think of. And most of these data are being used for business decision making right now. Now, in terms of this data protection, what are the concerns that you see? Now, we know the GDPR is the out uh, in the European uh, region. And I know uh, Oshada was also talking about Data Protection Act, which is going to be come out. So uh, in terms of the privacy of this data and uh, in terms of uh, how do you uh, face uh, and what challenges that you face uh, in terms of securing them? Uh, what, what, what do you see, uh, Adu? Yeah, I think you know data is obviously absolutely sacr sacrosanct uh, to, to protect. Right? You see, the challenge is that, uh, as we spoke earlier, that the data, you know, which used to be maybe largely central, right now it's uh, distributed. Right, your your crown jewels, so to speak, are now in a, somebody's computer at home or mobile phone or IoT device or on the cloud. So no longer it's in one place, right? It's all distributed everywhere. So, so your your data protection strategy also has to have a more integrated approach. You can't no longer just put a DLP or data leak prevention tool and and then hope that it, everything will work. Right? You have to make sure that uh, integrated strategy will cover your cloud usage, your endpoint uh, data protection, your um, uh, then your servers and so forth. So I think you have a lot more focus around the integrated approach for, for data protection now, right? And I think from a regulatory perspective, I think, you know, pretty clear that the now boards are a lot more responsible and more uh, executives are a lot more responsible. So I think the 
it's very crucial uh, for especially for large enterprises to have that risk view uh, you know brought up to your audit committee or risk committee or whatever the, the construct you have and at a maybe a small enterprise as this becomes a you know key issue at a, a very senior level in the company so that you can address these things and put the right uh, focus in there um, so i i think uh, I mean, at the crux of a lot of these stuff is about data protection, right? And, you know, uh, one is, you know, large part of data and then other part is infrastructure and your business disruption obviously comes with a, uh, with a exposure or attack. Uh, but the data protection, I think that the key is taking that uh, very uh, integrated approach uh, across all these uh, surfaces that you're using now to manage that. Thanks, man. So do you think that this is uh, the, the each organization need to take the responsibility and the leadership in uh, protecting the data that you have already created? Or, or I mean, why is that doing that? Or do you see that there should be kind of a regulator's uh, involvement as well now? Like, you know, you know, the, in the European region, the GDPR has brought some kind of a protection for all the EU uh, countries and the companies in terms of their protection. What do you see, like, you know, individually, you need to look after yourself fine, but do you think the regulator also need to come and support that uh, initiative? I, I think the, the regulator is already setting the standard, right? Saying, okay, you know, they are obviously trying to protect interest of the public, interest of the enterprises, you know, your, your say your private, private data and a lot more is now on the cloud and other people's computers, right? And, and as we go more digital, your ability for things like identity theft, uh, things like your misuse of the data that uh, somebody is collecting for one reason and getting used for another reason. So there lo there's a lot of uh, societal issues of uh, data leak now, right? As, as societies get more digital, obviously data becomes a crucial element that the government uh, step in to set the framework to protect, right? Because otherwise it becomes a larger issue for the, the citizens and the businesses in that country. So um, I think that's a role that the, the regulator should play. Obviously, I, I don't think it makes sense to regulate to come in and you know, put technology behind it uh, because it's a, it's a kind of, a, it's never a destination. Right? It's always a journey. Security, you know, you, you can never say I'm done with it, right? You know, you keep at it. Uh, uh, what I would like to call is always a journey and never a destination, right? You have to keep uh, addressing and, and keep moving forward. So, uh, yeah, so I think the government's role and the regulator's role is to really set the framework and the guide, guardrails so that the, the data is protected and the citizens and the businesses are protected. And uh, obviously it's the, the companies uh, who are uh, data collectors or data processor uh, that needs to really make sure that those are adhered to, right? And I think in most countries now we're becoming serious uh, uh, offense and, and with very, very serious penalties. Right? And, uh, so it's not a choice anymore. Uh, you have, if you're collecting somebody's data, uh, you better have a really strong strategy to protect it. Yeah, thanks. I, I like this phrase saying, always a journey, never a destination. That's a, that's a nice one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Zayak, I'd like to ask a question now with this, uh, uh, but I mean, in the what are the learning outcome from the financial service industry or even general from uh, COVID nineteen, and uh, what to, what should be the long term plans to uh, avoid cyber attacks? Okay, so uh, the learnings basically. Okay, so we um, we as a uh, the sector. We were not, uh, we were like so the, on the digital front, yes. I mean, we were far ahead uh, and we had a long term strategies on, and basically all the, uh, the tools and everything was uh, adapted and already available for the citizens to use uh, in a short period. So that was a uh, like vital factor, even like supporting for the 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 uh, community like okay. So when the uh, supermarket chains were coming up with the uh, the uh, Online stores, the banks were geared to take over the uh, the payment part, the most important part uh, of uh, basically supporting for uh, the with the payment uh, instruments. And uh, the, even the some banks were went and uh, like helped uh, help the the the, uh, the traders with the 
uh, starting their new ventures with uh, like giving priority marketplace infrastructure and all. So the uh, if you look at the long term, what will happen is okay. So with the uh, the current uh, the uh, situation, the we believe like okay. So the this will continue, and uh, there may be there will be uh, basically like a work a permanent work from home. Uh, the workforce will be available even for the banking sector. So that is what we are planning now. So. Uh, uh, so what what we are focusing right now on because like say the for the cyber uh, the uh, uh, with the new normal more than ever people element is of the security has become very vital factor to the maintaining strong security posture in any organization so threat management and the the constant vigilance has become key uh, uh, ensuring the cyber security in the current situation so and uh, what we are seeing is basically work from home uh, uh, the uh, segment has become major, main target for the criminals in, in uh, 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 the current context. <clears throat> so for the work from home, uh, employee protection, basically that's a key uh, area which we are like, which, which we should be focusing on uh, because uh, the, uh, by providing like say the proper remote access of there with the like, uh, Providing corporate uh, level virtual private networks, which which we have already I mean provided, but then the strong password policies. Then if you are supporting for bring your own devices, like uh, we want to ensure that the they are uh, they are adhering to the company's uh, policy rather than like uh, having their own uh, the uh, the way of uh, managing the antivirus, anti spyware, and also adapting to the company policies if you are bringing your uh, bring bring your own devices. And uh, also, like uh, uh, the within a shorter, the other challenge which we face was, I mean, the uh, collaboration tools. Uh, so during uh, the before the pandemic, okay, so we 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 never had a culture of like having virtual meetings. So, but with the uh, pandemic, okay, so the another challenge which we had was okay, so the quickly setting up the the unified communication uh, to collaborate the teams. So the uh, and uh, also you should look at the like uh, good practices on conducting the virtual meetings okay so like uh, uh, because the financial sector even the any corporate the uh, uh, the now even the board meetings are happening through the virtual meetings so the uh, uh, the security of uh, that aspect also has to be looked at like say the for an example having the strong passwords and like uh, for the sensitive topics uh, use a one-time pin meeting ids like uh, including multi-factor authentication and all these things and also like we should uh, uh, focus on basically looking at the uh, dlp part data protection and prevention part where like uh, when employees may be using unauthorized personal accounts and like uh, the application maybe email uh, to communicate with the uh, like uh, organization because I mean the sudden change, uh, the even we didn't had a time to educate properly the work from home workforce. Like okay, so in, in initially that was a challenge because overnight you got to set up this infrastructure. So long term, basically you have to educate all these uh, the uh, employees who are working from home. Like okay, so what are the best practices of uh, using like emails? Then the uh, the how, how how they should be handling uh, the uh, uh, sensitive information uh, while you are working from home because like say the uh, they are maybe like somebody's uh, 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 when you are the office environment versus the home environment is totally different so when you are like working in a uh, sort of a home environment uh, we don't know really like who is uh, 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 coming and basically what sort of a behavior you have. So you got to ensure that the uh, the similar environments and the similar practices are followed when you are uh, working with the home as well. So those are the aspects which you are uh, purely targeting, uh, like educating the workforces and all. Also like to uh, avoid the phishing attacks. Okay, so the uh, we are continuously reminding about the, uh, the suspicious mails which you are getting and not to open files and attachment, like say the not to click links, and the stress the factors of uh, cyber criminals will like uh, 
see to uh, capitalize the current situation, make sure that people uh, take extra care when uh, like dealing with emails that, uh, uh, especially when they ask for the credentials and all, which are seen, there are a uh, lot of uh, that sort of attacks are targeting uh, on the, uh, the even the most senior, uh, the colleagues in the uh, sector. So those are the high level areas which you are looking at. Thanks, Rizal. Uh, Indi, I'd like to post this question, question to you. Now, uh, in your thinking and believing uh, the cyber security, is it the responsibility of the, uh, the team who's looking after the security or the IT department? Or do you think it's a responsibility of all employees who have been given a network cable and an internet uh, computer? I think, uh, but with, with my understanding and like, you know, what has been getting practiced across the world, I feel it's a more of a shared, um, shared responsibility. So I think Madhu also explained, uh, it's a more of a boardroom discussion right now. And also which you have your audit committees or the like, you know, committees, what is been or the structure, what is that have in your organization, uh, everybody's involved in it. And it's a high level decision making right now. Uh, so as Nisala said, like, you know, which is your enabling the people to uh, work or do your transactions online, etc. Uh, you can't expect like, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's like, you know, one responsibility from one person. So it's, it's a more of a very much a 360, like, you know, shared responsibility uh, has to be going in. Now, if you take basic examples, like you now nowadays, all of us use uh, e-commerce platforms or like, you know, online platforms to order your day-to-day -day groceries, etc. right? So we need to understand, like, you know, when you go into these, you are given an email, password, login ID, etc. has been given. So how, how exactly, and some of it, we put our bank credit cards on it, even the basic, like, you know, the apps what we use right now. So as, as, as a user, I need to be aware, like, you know, the, uh, the credentials, how do I make sure the passwords are strong, etc. And nowadays, I think most of the banks has enabled, like, you know, OTP, when you do a transaction, you get an OTP code, then and there, like, you know, you need to re-enter. So I think these things has to be uh, known by across, uh, not only the IT specialized guys, or like, you know, not your IT branch or the decision makers. It's a responsibility of all of us to make sure that uh, uh, that is being given. And it, some people have this habit of like, you know, sharing your password and the login ID with uh, people like, like, you know, log into your device, etc. These things are, I mean, being practiced, right? Like, you know, I think these are in the modern day, uh, this is, uh, we can call it very dangerous. Like, you know, one of such uh, mis- uh, information can breach all your information in the org entire organization somebody can hack in so it's it's again reiterating it's a shared responsibility uh, which is with your organization and also uh, as we discussed before also like you know with the uh, the your regulators government actually coming into the action and strengthening and providing you more uh, strength and robust uh, ecosystem coming into your environment Thanks, Idiga. Akpash, I'd like to post this question to you. Uh, what are the key pillars in organization that you consider when implementing the zero trust framework? Solution, I mean, uh, Boshan, uh, like what uh, uh, I explained earlier, right? There are three major um, uh, pillars. One is um, verifying explicitly. Second one being the use uh, uh, use least privilege access and third one being the assuming that uh, the breach comes in. But underneath, there are multiple uh, components such as uh, um, uh, identity as an endpoint, right? Because identity and endpoint are two major, um, two major components that users would uh, uh, use in order to access their corporate information. Let them be connecting from uh, home or even within their corporate or from anywhere. They need to access um, their tools, which are uh, uh, the productivity tools that they have in order to be more productive and to accomplish their task. The tools also should talk to data, which is inside the organization. And there should be an infrastructure connecting this right, and the network, of course, right. So um, these two components like uh, identity and endpoint, uh, those two needs to be protected 
in uh, you know with the right uh, solutions right technologies that are available and apart from those pillars that i just mentioned that is identity endpoint data apps infrastructure network network the policy for the zero trust all right should be uh, uh, in the middle connecting these two different uh, uh, worlds that is identity and endpoints connecting to data apps infrastructure network of course the underlying should be the visibility analytics as well as automation right because whatever that we connect if we don't have the right uh, uh, data and uh, you know if you don't have the right tools to analyze uh, what's going on, right? So we will not be able to prevent in the future and we do not know what is the root cause of, of it. And of course, you know, in, 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 in the era that's coming, you know, in the, in, the, in the future, it will be all about automating things, right? So we know that when a email with a link comes in, uh, there could be something, some smart technology or some smart uh, uh, methods that using machine learning and AI infused uh, uh, stuff that would be able to scan the links that comes in against maybe a database of links, right? And say, this is phishing. This is uh, uh, an email that you should not open. All right. So that way that, uh, 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 and that will automatically be sent to the quarantine box or maybe it will be deleted or maybe it will be dropped, right? It does not go into the user who usually is the weakest link in a security chain, right? Like what Madhu earlier said, with, if the right knowledge is not being given, right? Uh, no, uh, we can't blame anyone. The user could click anything, right? So we see that there's a lot of pop-ups that comes in, people uh, clicks into those pop-ups and even some people even call and say, no, did I win the lottery or not, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, we, we live in a world like that. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a responsibility of the organization as well as uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, people within the IT in order to uh, educate uh, the business users saying that, you know, you click on this, you do not click on this. This is the way that, you know, uh, uh, emails comes in, these links are dangerous. You know, it, it may point into this, but you can educate on top of all these technologies that we are talking about. Right, so that most of the stuff would be killed uh, at the entry level itself. So components such as identity endpoint, which are too critical, which gives the access to data apps infrastructure network using the policy in the center. So those are the key uh, uh, components within the Zero Trust framework. Thanks, Aflash. Uh, Michael, I think in the interest of time, I would like to uh, post a second question to you, which I had it. Uh, in your presentation, Michael, uh, where I saw that you said by 2025, the BYOB devices is uh, coming up to about 12 billion IoT devices. Uh, and then it's going to be more of BYOB. Now, we, we all know when you have a BYOB, the organization cannot uh, make it compulsory all the security uh, protocols of the organizations in that device because that device is not owned by the organization. Now, how, where do you see the challenges in cybersecurity when you see more BYOB devices coming out? Yeah, so uh, based on the business need uh, perspective, uh, uh, allowing users to use different methods to do business, access data, et cetera, are becoming, uh, no. Uh, uh, business need uh, and uh, not allowing it is going to have a major impact uh, in terms of flexibility, in terms of scalability, uh, time to market, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to affect from various aspects perspective. So uh, from a solution perspective, the customers needs to look at uh, what are the ways and means, how you can uh, identify this BYOD devices in terms of what kind of a devices. It, for example, uh, uh, recently we have introduced a, a, a IoT license whereby uh, uh, we can identify what is the kind of a device which is connecting, whether it is a uh, Apple device or whether it is an Android device running, what kind of a firmware. So 
you can have a policy which says if the access is happening from an iPhone, this is the kind of access what I will give to an iPhone user. So that's the kind of uh, you know, uh, research and uh, kind of intelligence what is getting built into it uh, to see as to know how users uh, still can be given that uh, restrictive access wherever possible and uh, uh, also get the visibility in terms of what kind of uh, devices are being used and accordingly control what uh, data or application can be uh, used. So IoT, uh, there is a lot of development happening uh, on the security front uh, on, on, on that domain itself. So I'm sure going forward, there'll be more and more uh, robust solutions coming in to take care of this challenge, what is, used by, uh, what is faced by the users. Oshan, if I may add a quick point to that one, I think that's an interesting point that we talk about. You know, this good security is not only about protection, right? It's all about also making your company more innovative. You know, you can open up a lot more things for people to access. BYOD is a great example, right? And uh, you can use, you know, things like uh, your cloud access security brokers and, and create an environment that if you're from your office machine and you're accessing it, you get a certain amount of privileges. But I want to access it from my son's computer downstairs, I want to send a quick mail, I can still access it, but it'll give you an understand who you are and where you're coming from and give a different level of access, right? So uh, good security design really enables uh, companies to do more and, and enables more innovation, right? And I think that's, a, that's something we should also bear in mind as we uh, as we look at this stuff. It's not about, you know, putting lots of gates and uh, and, and gates around things to uh, to prevent things, but it's also about enabling business to be more innovative. Absolutely, I think security has to be supporting the business operations, not being a road roadblock for that. Exactly right. Right. So th thank you, Madhu, and thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Michael for uh, coming on board and uh, spending your time and doing a keynote and giving the insight of what's happening outside and uh, also about some of the global cases. And I must thank our panelists, uh, Madhu, Misala, Akfaj, Indika, and also Oshada who was with us. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, ideas, and most importantly, spending your time with us almost two hours. Thank you very much and taking time of your busy schedule and being joining the ICC webinar that we talk about the cybersecurity. I must thank the, uh, the sponsor today. The, you know, any event will not be successful without a sponsor. So uh, Michael, your company, Fortinet, I think the local uh, team, I must thank the local team for coming forward and uh, sponsoring the event. Thank you very much for the Fortinet team. Finally, I must thank the ICC team and uh, Ruan Sinanayak and the team for hosting this event and uh, without having any technical glitch. And Ruan has been one of our key people in the ICC webinar series and all the uh, uh, events and seminars that we are having. So once again, thank you everyone for your time. And uh, I must also thank all the viewers. Uh, some of the questions were posted, but I asked uh, in a general format. Uh, thank you for everyone for watching this and uh, we will keep you informed of the next webinar that uh, we, the ICC Sri Lanka will be hosting. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pushan. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Pushan. Thank you, Nisala.